This is the Chronicles Podcast, a production of Chronicles Magazine, the original outlet for paleoconservative thought and a bastion of the authentic right in America. Well, welcome to episode 10 of the Chronicles Magazine podcast. I'm here today with Paul Gottfried, and we're going to be talking about different authors and books and some of the intellectual influences on him. So, Paul, thank you for coming on today. Thank you for having me on today. We, I, I asked you if you could come up with five of your favorite authors or, or most influential authors, and you said that was impossible. Mm-hmm. So why is that impossible? That is impossible, and I... Uh, because I, I, well, I began making a list of thinkers who have influenced me, and I have about 40 um, that I listed uh, and didn't even reach the 16th century. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, it's, it's very, I, I, I think would, I would probably have a list of several hundred people by the time I finished. Um, and uh, e- even the list that I have, I think, is sort of arbitrary. I just threw down names. Of people influenced, there were, there were many, many more classical thinkers who I, I, I noticed I did not include Aeschylus, um, Oristea, Sophocles, Antigone, a whole bunch of important literary works from the ancient period. So um, I, I, I prefer not, you know, having these long lists. Um, and it would be very hard for me to come up with four or five thinkers who uh, uh, influenced me the most because. Uh, I, I don't think I'd be capable of coming up with only four or five names. Okay. Let me ask you this then. Does anyone come to mind if I said, uh, you know, there's been a long lost essay or book that was previously unpublished that you really hope you can read? Like if there's a thinker that comes to mind that you wish you could have read more of or had written more, uh, does anyone come to mind if I asked you that question? Yeah, but I, I, I think it would be related to what I'm working on at the present time or what mm-hmm. I've worked on in recent years. Um, I mean, I, I, I wrote on a classical text at one time, um, on Polybius, um, on, on um, Thucydides, other, other ancient authors, and it's sort of hard to go back there. I wrote on Kant, but it's like sort of hard to go back there, you know, and to try to revive those interests and <laughs> revive the kind of scholarship I once did. Um, as you know, I'm very interested in Carl Schmitt, just about anything by him mm-hmm. I read. Um, he's a fascinating thinker. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, one thinker uh, who impressed me when I was about your age, but doesn't impress me that much anymore is Nietzsche. Uh, I used to adore Nietzsche. I loved his, his prose, German prose. Uh, I thought he was very clever. I find less and less in Nietzsche the, the older I get. But that's not true of Carl Schmitt, right? I, I, th- I think he was, he was a profound thinker. I mean, the, the, he was not... Uh, particularly nice man, and he was obviously a political opportunist, but he had profound understanding um, of politics. And he was an historicist of the right. I think we were discussing this before. I mean, he understood the importance of context um, and structures of authority, you know, in uh, defining societies and defining their legal codes and so forth. Um, so I've, uh, he does interest me. Uh, as, as you know, my favorite book by Schmidt um, is Begriff des Politischen, the concept of the political, which I find a fascinating work. Uh, but then I also love uh, Aristotle's politics, about de Jean Baudin, there are a whole bunch of other thinkers, uh, Hegel, whom I enjoy reading, mm-hmm. and from whom I've learned a great deal. Why do you think you've been drawn specifically to the German intellectual tradition? Um, I, I think, I think it would be, before one of the program, we probably underrated thinkers um, I think there are many German thinkers who are absolutely brilliant, uh, but whom we don't study, particularly in the United States, um, um, you know, unless we have an asterisk beside them, which we reserve for people who somehow looked, uh, uh, looked toward the Third Reich or, you know, the, <clears throat> the evil outcome of German history or something like that. But um, I am more impressed by German political social thinkers than by most others. I also, uh, you know, I suppose I'm sort of omnivorous here. I, I, there are many Italian thinkers, Pareto, Mosca, Machiavelli, who are great, you know, great uh, uh, writers and have profound insights into the political. And, so, and, and the same thing was true about many of the French. I think I'm, I'm perhaps less interested in 
the English, although I admire Hume greatly as a philosopher, and like you, I am very impressed by Edmund Burke, particularly his critique of the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you think part of it, do you think part of all this is that there wasn't sort of, there wasn't a, a natural, um, you know, element of continental European thinkers. And so you had to discover them for yourself, whereas it's, it, you know, the British tradition is more uh, accessible. Yeah, you strange, strangely enough, when I was in college, I was exposed to a lot of German thinkers. And that's because I hung around a lot of German Jews who were, you know, were interested. They were not only Marxist, but they were interested in Hegel and Kant and so forth, Schopenhauer, on whom I actually did a book. Uh, so, so there, there. Um, I, I was exposed to this. Um, I, one of the things that I noticed in the conservative movement, and which um, occasioned my production of the search for historical meaning, um, was the unwillingness to recognize the importance of German political thought, particularly Hegel, mm -hmm. which I argue in that book ha had an influence on in a number of people on the right who had earlier Marxists who were obviously influenced by Hegel's thought as well. And that, that book was, I know Robert Nisbet loved that book and he reviewed it very favorably in National Review, but most conservatives whom I knew did not like that book because they stressed America as an extension of England or something which came out of the English tradition. Um, I, I, as I told people, I'm not anti-British. I just think, uh, you know, there are non-British thinkers who have influenced me a good deal more than, than, than most English thinkers, mm -hmm. uh, even on the right. Do you think the British, do you think their tradition has less of an emphasis on the dynamics of, of formal political power and more of a cultural uh, emphasis? Yes. Yeah, I think that's true. Or constitutional development. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's, mu there's much to admire about the British tradition. Um, I just somehow I find the Germans and the French and the Italians to be more relevant mm -hmm. to understand what's, what's, what's happening right now. Um, you know, I, I also respect the British liberal tradition. I'm not, I'm not against it. I just think it is, um, uh, it is by now exhausted. We're not going to go back to it, you know. And I, I, think these, I think to understand historical context, as I said before, it's much more valuable to read German, Frenchmen, and even some Italians. Mm -hmm. I mean, when people use the word liberal today, they have a, a universalist uh, mentality of, about liberalism. You have more of a rooted historicist mm -hmm. uh, understanding of liberalism. Can you make those distinctions real quick? Yeah, I mean, I consider Edmund Burke to be a liberal. I mean, he's a Whig, you know, but he understands a tradition of liberty, which he sees as coming out of his country. Mm -hmm. It is not. You know, that, that's why when people say, you know, the Second Amendment was given to us by God, I don't know what they're talking, natural right or something. No, it is a tradition which goes back to medieval England. It was the it was the uh, the privilege of a free man to 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 own arms, mm -hmm. and the founders of America simply gave that to American not not to the whole world. They gave that to American citizens. That was the right of American citizens. So I I, th I think that this this is much more useful way to approach this. Uh, whenever I hear this talk about human rights, natural, I, I mean, I, uh, my, I become almost queasy when I listen to this stuff. I mean, it's such nonsense. Why can't you defend something as part of an historical tradition, you know, which is valuable and which you're trying to preserve instead of, you know, ascribing it to God or saying the creator. I, I'm, not, I'm not even denying that it may be providential and that God has a hand in this or something. But it comes out of history. It comes out of an historical tradition that we're trying to uphold. <clears throat> okay, let's step back, and we're gonna. The first category we're gonna discuss is various underrated thinkers. So let's start. Mm -hmm. Let's start with the uh, the revolutionary era. Um, we have the European counter revolutionaries. Um, Burke is among them. But who do you think some of the underrated, um, you know, counter revolutionary writers would be? Oh well, definitely Mestre, the mm -hmm. soirée. It, brilliant. I mean, the conversations, the political questions raised. I mean, he's not only one of the greatest stylists in the French language, he's a profound political thinker, Mestre. Um, so I suppose he would rate as somebody who is who was underrated. By the way, I think that Hume is an important political thinker. I don't think this is properly understood. I think Hobbes is an important, Hobbes is another one. Oshman. He is one of my favorite writers on politics. Uh, I, I love Leviathan, on which I've I've written extensively. So uh, I tell people, you know, if I have to choose a natural rights theorist, I'll take uh, Hobbes over Locke any day. I think he's a much deeper thinker. 
Why why do people um, blame Hobbes for like liberalism today? Yeah, because he does talk about natural right. You know, you have a, you have a right to life, and it's a natural right. Now he doesn't really go very far with it because he argues that you know you, you even if you are um, acquired by a foreign ruler and you stay the, in, in his territory, you've acquiesced in his rule. And you're exercising your natural right to life by staying there. He becomes your protector. And in return for his protection, you owe him loyalty. So um, there's not a vigorous natural right tradition, but but there is an, and also social contract theory, which by the way, is not created by Hobbes. It's found in the 16th century, both in Spanish Jesuits and in the Scottish Presbyterians developed natural uh, a, a social social compact theory, and Hobbes and Locke and others take it over in the uh, in the seventeenth century. But it's a natural uh, the uh, social compact theory, the natural rights, also the individualist individualism. It's atomistic. He's not talking as Aristotle about the social whole, about a society, about about a polity. You know, rooted. He's talking about um, uh, about individuals who agree to live under a sovereign. Let's talk about other counter-revolutionary thinkers. Let's talk about, there's another Frenchman, um, Louis Bonnet, is that how you say his name? Bonal. Bonal. Yeah. Would you, would you consider him an underrated thinker? I don't really know. You know, Robert Nisbe wrote his dissertation on uh, Louis, Louis, on du, uh, du divorce, on divorce, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, Bonal argues against this. Um, he's okay. There's just... Uh, there's a certain kind of neo-Thomist Catholic character to a thinking that doesn't really make him interesting. But one of the reasons Mestre is interesting is he's a radical Catholic, mm-hmm. right? Heavily influenced by Gnosticism and by Rosicrucianism, all kinds of other things. Um, and, uh, you know, he's, he is a much more of an independent mind than I find in Bonal. Another person who um, also seems to be, you know, a, a very, very strict Catholic and a Catholic thinker but has brilliant ideas about um, the direction in which society is going is Denoso Cortez, on whom uh, Carl Schmidt wrote. And Denoso Cortez um, uh, comes up with a, with a theory of uh, almost sort of apocalyptic theory of politics that once you deny authority, established authority, long established authority, there's nothing that is going to keep society in its place. Everything is going to fall. And I, th- I think he's, I think he's right. Um, I've been heavily, uh, although I would say, I think the, you know, liberal societies at their best, like 19th century England or the United States, they're fine. Uh, I think, but I think the counter revolutionaries are correct in their understanding of authority. That's why I'm always drawn. And uh, Carl Schmidt is a shame, you know, because he sort of a more secularized version of counter revolutionary thing. And I think they're, they understand the price you pay in overthrowing traditional authority mm-hmm. in traditional social order. And mm-hmm. we're paying that price for it and it'll, it'll get worse. And I think they understood this, you know, already in the early 19th century after looking at the effects of the French Revolution. One of the things I find fascinating about Maestra is he he was very optimistic, actually. He thought that the French Revolution would fail and the um, you know, the mm-hmm. Ancien regime would, would return. And yeah. it was kind of a judgment of God what was happening, but they would learn their lesson. Are there any that predicted that it was absolute doom and there was no hope for the aristocracy? I think Denoso comes pretty close to uh, to predicting that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know about Burke. I mean, Burke is simply he's warning about where the French Revolution would go. Burke is in some ways the most interesting because a lot of what he says is less characteristic of the French Revolution than what is going on right now. He's extremely relevant. He talks about being stripped of their identity as men, women, whatever they're. This is correct. This is the essence of wokeness and modern radicalism. Mm-hmm. You know, and, he, and I'm not sure the French Revolution ever went as far as what he's describing. And he was writing in 1790, but he's certainly describing the modern democratic um, uh, enterprise that we're living through right now. Mm-hmm. In, in On the American front, um, you would probably say that most of the intellectuals in America were against the French Revolution. Are there any that come to mind that would have been, you know, influential in talking about the dangers of what was happening in France? Well, you know, you get this in Hamilton, 
um, some of the uh, the high federalists in New England, they were absolutely terrified of the French Revolution. George Washington, uh, the one who was, who was for a long time very optimistic was Thomas Jefferson and the Jeffersonians. Although they were slave owners in Virginia and Ram Plantations, uh, you know, some of them thought the French Revolution was great mm -hmm. um, in France. <laughs> Uh, but they, you know, they were even willing, you know, to express support for it in the United States. They do become eventually disillusioned, but it takes a while. But I think the high federalists understand this. Um, what, one of the problems I think that we have appreciating the high federalists um, is that they typically believe in a powerful centralized state. Because only a powerful centralized state can deal with the excesses of democracy and something like the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they're, 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 taking, they're taking that position, um, uh, like Ames in um, Massachusetts and others who are uh, high federalists, not because they believe in the modern therapeutic leftist state, but because they want a counter-revolutionary state in effect. Mm -hmm. And they do not trust the people <laughs> in the United States or in France. So, um, these people definitely understand what's happening in France. I don't think they're under illusion. There were some Federalists who actually welcomed the uh, the uprisings in uh, the West Indies in the 1790s, so that, you know, but but most of the Federalists did not, and particularly the New England Federalists who were extremely conservative. I mean, someone like John Adams is very conservative, you know, once you have the, once America establishes independence. So, um, you know, I, I think these people also have a profound understanding of where modern radicalism was going. Mm -hmm. Let's move forward to sort of the post-Napoleonic age. Um, are there any underrated thinkers in, you know, the Victorian England or, or in the continental Europe that you would point out should be read more? Yeah, you know, Fitz James Stevens, um, whom, whom I've been, Leslie Stevens, uh, the Stevens family. Oh, they do produce Virginia Woolf, who was, you know, a political nutcase, a psychological, like commit suicide. Um, but her, but her, her, her family are extremely impressive. And, you know, but, um, uh, uh, Leslie Stevens is, is a critic of John Stuart Mill. And he is a true 19th century liberal, but an anti-Democrat. Um, and uh, uh, I, I admire them. I, I'm sort of less... Uh, admiring of Thomas Carlyle than I know some people on the certainly on the uh, uh, the ultra reactionary right are mm -hmm. <laughs> some of the people who write for Chronicles. Um, I just don't find very much depth in Carlyle. There's a kind of protest outrage, you know, at uh, uh, leveling the industrial age. He even defended slavery <laughs> at one point, uh, but I, I don't find that much depth in Carlyle. Uh, there, there are a lot of interesting sayings you can find in him, but he's, I don't think he's a particularly deep thinker. You know, that's it's fascinating because I just had a conversation with Nima Parvini on Carlisle, and I don't know if you listened to it. Um, I had a lot of fun. I have a lot of fun with Carlisle. I don't know if I draw anything in an, um, in an academic way from him, but he's always mm -hmm. you know exciting to me to hear what he has to say. And I love reading about his um, his mood swings and um, right. just the vituperations that he would you know lay on his friends and his relationship with all sorts of literary figures. And he was he was ultimately uh, an exciting like doom doomer. You know, he thought you know it was the <laughs> kind of the end of Europe. Uh, and I find that fascinating as someone who's you know uh, may see in him this. A lot, a lot of correct critiques about about what was happening in in Britain in the Victorian age. What about on the continent? Um, are there any Are there any Victorian yeah, age about, about, about Carlisle? Yeah. That uh, I think in in a, in a course of two days, I visited Carlisle's home on the Thames in London, and uh, Emerson's home. I visited my 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 children in Concord, uh, and of course Carlisle stayed at Emerson's home, and Emerson visited Carlisle. Nietzsche, if you remember, thought much more highly of Emerson than he did of Carlyle. Mm -hmm. thought, in fact, he thought Emerson was an extremely clever writer, Afrist. <laughs> sort of, you would never expect Nietzsche to be, uh, you know, to be so drawn to Emerson. We consider, you know, to almost a kind of trite uh, writer. To, but he was, he thought he was great. And but he did not like Carlyle. He thought uh -huh. Carlyle was just a very confused person. <laughs> what do you think so you, you i mean you mentioned nietzsche and he's kind of in that uh you know mid 19th century mm -hmm. um 
and he's, you know, obviously from Germany. Are there any other Germans or French or Italians or other continental Europeans during this time that you would look to? Oh, yeah, there, there are lots and lots of uh, <laughs> thinkers whom I admire um, in just about all these countries. Um, uh, I did a, I, my first work was on Schopenhauer. I think he's a magnificent writer, deep thinker, good philosopher, but his, um, uh, his essays are absolutely brilliant. You know, he's, uh, I recommend him to anyone. He, he's one of the great writers in the German. I, I like his German much better than that, actually, than that of Nietzsche. Uh, Jakob Burkhardt, the historian, um, the Weltgeschichtliche Betrachtung in uh, his world historical observation. He wrote all kinds of, and his, his histories are great too, like the history of Rome in the time of Constantine the Great, his work on the Italian Renaissance. I mean, in some ways they're sort of deeply subjective, but they're great works of history. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I just about every, every European country features great thinkers. <laughs> if I had to list them all, there'd probably be several hundred. So uh, mm -hmm. perhaps I should even try to list them. <laughs> um, I, I recommend to everybody Fustel de Collange on the ancient city. Mm -hmm. It's a great work of history. Um, and it's written from a, a pro-Latin, French nationalist, anti-German perspective, which some people don't appreciate. It came out at the time um, of uh, the Prussian defeat of France. Uh, and it's an attempt to emphasize the Latin roots of the French people, as opposed to the Germanic roots, you know, which you have in Gobineau and other people uh, writing on uh, uh, the uh, the genealogy of the French aristocracy. But it's a great work; it's a brilliant work of history. Mm -hmm. And having been trained as a European historian, uh, I find a great deal to admire in all these countries: in Italy, France, uh, every which Eastern Europe, just about every country is. Uh, is culturally very productive um, in the 19th century. Do you have a do you have any opinions on um, like the, like the Protestant thinkers versus Catholic thinkers in terms of their you know conservatism and their opposition to you know the liberal momentum? Yeah, I don't find that much difference. Mm -hmm. um, there there is uh, one of the great conservative thinkers who is actually of Jewish origin, Friedrich Stahl. Um, uh, Prussia was, was the head of the um, the Alt Conservative and the, the Prussian Conservative Party, uh, who was Jewish, who became Lutheran and wrote on Lutheran theology, all kinds of things like that. He's an absolutely brilliant conservative thinker, very much underappreciated, and he's very he's of course he's also very reactionary, but uh, he is uh, again he's uh, somebody who warns about the breakdown of authority. And you get pretty much the same message from Catholic thinkers right, writing at the same time. Um, my, my, my doctoral dissertation was on Catholic romanticism and they were mostly you know, romantic conservatives writing. The, I, I quote Protestant ones too, who are saying pretty much the same things. I don't, the, the only difference is that you know, Catholics will typically say that the Reformation was a bad thing. And uh, everything was like good in the Middle Ages and the high Middle Ages. I hear them from some of my Catholic colleagues now, you know, that um, the Reformation was a disaster. It led to the French Revolution and the American Revolution and so forth. Typically, the Protestant conservatives will stress the, the, the inherent conservatism of Luther, mm -hmm. who was the most conservative thinker of his time. <laughs> I've, I, by the way, I, I think one might make the argument that eventually Protestant becomes sectarian and influenced by the zeitgeist. Of course, the Catholic Church does as well, but it certainly starts off as an ultra conservative uh, enterprise. I mean, it's, uh, and I think uh, Eric von Kundelte Dean, you know, the Austrian Catholic risk, I mean, the same, he says that as much as he might want to criticize where Protestants went, he said Luther and Calvin were profoundly conservative Christians, you know. That's fascinating to, to me. Because I mean turn to the past. <laughs> you know, as a classical Protestant myself, and I don't want this to make this a you know a Protestant episode and Chronicles viewers are Catholic and Protestant, and I welcome both of them. But you know, as personally, I'm I'm someone who's Protestant, but I hear I, I do I am familiar with the Catholic uh, understanding of historical development there. So I'm interested in the fact that Ladine um thought this was uh, an overstated mm -hmm. Development that's interesting to me. Yeah, he 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 did. I mean, he he does not like Protestantism because he mm -hmm. thinks he's people on at the deep end, and 
He identifies Catholicism with peasant cultures and Arist- he was an aristocrat, an Austrian aristocrat. Right. But he said he cannot find anything radical about the, the founders of the Reformation. He said that, you know, that Luther was a, I mean, actually they're trying to go back to the early church, you know, and uh, uh, reclaim a Christian patrimony in the past. And of course, if you look at Luther as politically was on the far right, I mean, it's, you know, it's very hard to describe him as, as a political radical of any, of any kind. Um, but, you know, he was celebrated by the East German communist. Maybe they had no choice because he was an East German Luther, right? He was from Saxony, um, from Wittenberg. And so they, uh, they see him as somehow foreshadowing the bourgeois revolution which leads eventually to socialism. I think there is truth in that. I mm-hmm. mean, Protestantism is formative for uh, the Protestant work ethic, which is the middle class, you know, the mm-hmm. bourgeoisie. So I, I think in that sense, Luther is sort of looking, you know, l- looking at the age that was, that was going to emerge, you know, in the next few centuries. Um, but certainly he viewed himself and many of his father viewed him as, as very conservative. <clears throat> mm-hmm. especially the way he reacts to the peasant revolt, mm-hmm. you know, and his support of his support of the aristocracy. Someone that comes to mind is um, like a disciple of Stahl would be um, the Dutch uh, writer uh, Van Prinster. Have you read any of that? Yes, yes. There are, there are a number of Dutch uh, Calvinist theologians, you know, in the, uh, in, the, in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. he he came out of the same world that would produce, uh, you know, the Christian Democrat movement like Kuyper and, and right. some of those people, too. So they were all anti-revolutionary and they were very relatively uh, defensive of authority and structure and the historical continuity. You know, as, <clears throat> was, was Abraham Kuyper himself a conservative? I have no idea. I don't I don't think I mean, <laughs> it's it's hard to you know, de- it, it depends on how you define it. Um you know, that's that's a difficult one. But, you know, just bringing to mind just the anti-revolutionary rhetoric right. of some of these people uh, is fascinating to me as well. I want to move forward and back to America and talk about some of the underrated, uh, underrated thinkers among the South, um, because, of course, for, for various political reasons, you know, nobody talks about them anymore, but they have a lot mm-hmm. to say, too. But I want to start that question uh, with the fact that that the South, they don't talk a lot about um, the dynamics of power. They're very anti-Hobbesian. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what what can we still learn from the Southern uh, traditionalists, even though they wouldn't come out of the same uh, tradition that you identify with? Well, um, I do identify to some extent with the Southerners, not Thomas Jefferson, whom they're always pulling out, <clears throat> who sort of falls back into a conservative position in his later years, but is certainly a radical in his youth and produces the Declaration of Independence with its natural right uh, proposition. But I, I think John C. Calhoun uh, is definitely conservative. Robert Louis Dabney, the Calvinist theologian, is very conservative. Uh, so I, 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 think, I think there is a traditional conservative character to, conserv- to, uh, to Southern political thinking. And I think to some extent it's reflected in the, in the agrarians. By the way, I'm not really critical of them. I, I just think if we're looking, if you want an analytic instrument for understanding the present time, I mean, Hobbes may Hobbes or Schmidt may be more valuable, but I think these people are genuine conservative, you know, classical conservatives, the, uh, <clears throat> the Southerners. Uh, and I find much to admire about their tradition. Uh, now they probably would like if I said this, but I admire both the New Englanders and the Southerners. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they don't like each other. I like the high federalist. I like John C. I mean, I agree with Russell Kirk. I think they're all conservatives. Yeah, they all reflect the, uh, you know, the uh, conservative, the de- conservative in Geist. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, by the way, you know, the title of that book was taken from Henry Regnery, who was a Germanophile, <laughs> who, who loved Hegel and, and liked the word Geist, so became <laughs> the conservative mind. The okay. Kirk- the Kirkians seem to hate everything German, but yeah. the title is obviously Hegelian. Right, um, right. So, um, yeah, but, I, you know, I, uh, I was just asked to speak at the Abbeville Institute, and I expressed profound admiration for the Southern tradition uh, and regret that it's been so totally destroyed by, by, by fake Southern conservatives and Republicans in the South and so forth. 
<clears throat> I mean, one of the primary exponents of, of paleoconservatism in our time was Mel Bradford and Sam Francis, and both right. of them were Southerners. Uh, you know, what, what about their Southerness, you know, drove their interpretation of things? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think in the case of Sam Francis, the Southerness is maybe more peripheral to his conservatism. And I say that because he spent most of his life outside the South uh, and did not have particular, any kind of particular interest in Southern institutions, although he was very close to Mel Bradford. And he is heavily influenced, as you can see, by Pareto, James Burnham, um, and others, you know, uh, other people who wrote on elites, Muska. Um, uh, his, his Southerners, as I said, is not that important. In the case of Bradford, it's, it's like all over. I mean, it comes mm -hmm. out of the Southern agrarian tradition. He obviously hates Lincoln, hates the, what the Union side did to the South in the Civil War. Um, and by the way, with good reason. <laughs> I, I mean, if you, uh, uh, although one can rejoice at the end of slavery, the, uh, there's over 700,000 people who die in that stupid war. And Reconstruction was, was, was just a horror, mm -hmm. uh, which, which did not bring the races together. And so, so, uh, so a lot of the, the, all the conservative Southerners are looking at this. Um, Sam Francis, by the way, did not have much interest. I mean, he, he said that, you know, Lincoln was probably not that good a president. He made mistakes or something. Mm -hmm. Whereas most of the Southern conservatives will become apoplectic when you mention Lincoln in the mm -hmm. Civil War. Uh, um, but there's no question that Mel Bradford, you know, uh, creates his whole political theory about his, around his Southerness, you know, what it means to be a Southern. One of the interesting aspects of Mel's writing, and he was a friend of mine as well, uh, is, is that he, um, uh, he tries to understand how Southern plantation owners could also accept some notion of, of natural right, since obviously they were not practicing it, right? I mean, they had slaves, they were living in a very, uh, very hierarchical society in which people were not equal. And uh, he tries to explain this in his writing and, uh, you know, at the, at the end of the day, I mean, they, they, these people do seem to be compartmentalized, in my view. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that the person who breaks out of this is Calhoun and the people of his generation who become European conservatives, they become the same as, you know, the, as Mestre and these people, and, and they're defending hierarchy, order, inequality. Um, but... Uh, you know, somehow there, there, there is a kind of a disconnect between Jefferson, the plantation owner, and Jefferson writing about natural rights and all men are created equal and so forth. But um, this is a question I think that Bradford wrestled with, you know, and tried to answer in his writings. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, he also wrote some very good essays on Southern literature, which was his field. Right. <laughs> I almost completely agree, you know, with a lot of the Southern critiques of what was happening in, uh, you know, federal politics at the time. Um, but, but to you, you know, there is a use for Abraham Lincoln, and you don't think he is the devil. Uh, can you can you comment just quickly on on uh, what we could draw from someone like Lincoln? Is there anything valuable in him? Yes, he's a brilliant speaker. He's probably mm -hmm. the greatest speaker in England. I mean, or he's oratorically brilliant. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I, he's, he, he, and, he's and, and he does appeal to morality. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I mean, you know, he, he does, he, he frames his moral arguments in terms of natural right, sometimes, more often in terms of biblical morality, he's always quoting the Bible, mm -hmm. and uses biblical verses extremely well. Um, I think he also understood that race problems in the United States were not going to go away, even if you free the slaves. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, I think he wrestled with that problem and, you know, he, he wanted to uh, move blacks out of the country and move them somewhere else. And then after the civil war, so events sort of overtook him, you know, and he sort of grunt, you know, he did, he did oppose slavery. What one of the, the 13th amendment was uh, not by the 14th or 15th, that, that those I think Lincoln probably would have balked at the 13th amendment. He strongly supported, he did favor the abolition of, and he was right. And, um, you know, I, I cannot, uh, question or, or the notion of a house divided, uh, whether Southerners won, <laughs> he, was, he was correct. I think the Civil War was, was avoidable. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, slavery would have gone away in time. And, the, and to me, the destruction was, to, and there's much to admire about the Southern planter class. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, 
they're chivalrous, they're very aristocratic pe people, and their way of life is not to be frowned at. I mean, as Jean Genovese wrote, even as a Marxist. So, um, well, that's a good segue. Uh, that's a good segue. Let, let, let's talk about uh, Genovese and, and the, yeah. the traditional Marxists. Well, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know whether Jean was ever traditional. He was, a, again, a friend of mine and a mentor. I don't think he was ever a traditional Marxist. He was much too conservative to be traditional. He was well to the right of, of, of any conservatism we now have on most social and moral issues and so forth, even when he called himself a Marxist. Um, but you can see a certain kind of Marxist interpretive framework in the way he writes. I mean, he is looking at classes and the dynamics of class relations and the relationship between Southern slave owners and, um, uh, and, and industrial capitalism in the North. Uh, I think he is perfectly correct when he says that slavery was basic to Southern cultural and social identity. There's no way you get around that. I know, uh, you know, uh, uh, many of my friends in the Abbeville Institute or this will say, oh no, this is, this is just something we can't even count. No, it, it, it is basic, just the way um, you have to talk about things like feudalism I mean, uh, when you talk about the Middle Ages. The South is a feudal society. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the, the, the black slaves at the bottom are like serfs. In, mm -hmm. in European, it's you're looking at something that, in many ways, replicates a traditional European society, and the North was something very different, right? It was an industrial, becoming an industrial capitalist society, mm -hmm. and there is an element of there is a class conflict, and the, the 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 struggle that goes on in the United States between North and South looks like things that are happening in Europe at the same time where you have consolidated na nation states fighting against feudal aristocracies. Um, the Austro-Prussian War in 1866 looks very much like the American, it wasn't as bloody, it was more controlled, you know, and you had Bismarck uh, rather than Lincoln running things. But, you know, Austria was a Catholic feudal society. They're defeated by a Protestant industrial society, Prussia, which then unifies Germany. The Swiss Sonderbund, in the 1840s were Catholic, uh, mostly rural societies fighting against Protestant societies that wanted a centralized government. Mm -hmm. uh, so that the struggle of centralism, modern centralizing states against feudal aristocracy is something that's going on <laughs> everywhere, not just in the United States. Um, what makes the American case different is the kind of moralizing that goes with it, the ideology from which we have never been able to free ourselves. And the Southerners are right about that. Mm -hmm. You know, that we have a, a mission to bring democracy and equality. A lot of this rhetoric, unfortunately, is already present in Lincoln, mm -hmm. uh, who was trying to look for a justification for it was a very messy war. And as you know, we're fighting for freedom and equality as promised in the Declaration of Independence. Um, but, you know, th that was a justification for the struggle that, uh, came back to haunt us many times, I would say, in a moralistic globalist foreign policy and, uh, you know, an, a yet unfulfilled mission to bring equality to the United States. Um, in Europe, it wasn't quite that disastrous, but there were, I think Genovese was right. There's the same social dynamic, you know, which he as a Marxist is looking at. Um, you don't have to be a Marxist, by the way, to see that. I mean, it's obvious to me, the social dynamic is, is there you know, and is the best way to understand the war. What other what other uh, Marxists at the time can conservatives learn lessons from? I, I think just about most of the Marxists writing in the early 20s, the German Marxists, like Kautsky and uh, Rudolf Hilferding in Austria, other, they, they have profound insights into what was going on. <clears throat> By the way, I think Karl Marx's historical writings are marvelous. Um, mm -hmm. So... Uh, you know, I, in that sense, I, I suppose I'm not anti-Marxist. Um, uh, you know, the, um, uh, I, I think a, a, uh, an intelligent conservatism, which we don't have, of course, would appreciate the contributions of, of Marx and many of the Marxists. Uh, and it's interesting that the new right in Europe is heavily influenced by Marxism. Mm -hmm. and they make no secret, and Gramsci, and they make no secrets about this. <clears throat> 
one of the things like like if you take someone like Alan Carlson, you know, who's um, who's a great writer and he's, you know, defendant mm-hmm. of the of the agrarian way, uh, you know, he says that there's uh, you know, there, there are aspects of Marxist criticism of industrialization um, that he mm-hmm. thinks conservatives can benefit from as well. Yeah, no, I agree with Alan. My yeah. Dear. Yeah. So so those are some of the underrated. Let's let's move forward a little bit um, into the 20th century. Uh, who do you think are some of the most? You mentioned Carl Schmidt, but what other highly underrated uh, thinkers are there that are interpreting what's going on in the American age? Well, um, I think you mentioned Karl Mannheim mm-hmm. before. The uh, it was a Hungarian German Jewish sociologist who wrote on conservatism, and I think uh, in his essay in a book, Das Konservative Denken, pretty much defines the nature of conservatism. Uh, you know, I, I'm very much, and he also wrote on utopianism and so forth. Um, I, 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 I don't know if he's underrated. I think people should read him more often. I had never, <laughs> I mean, I had never heard of him before you right, um, right. mentioned him in a book. So, uh, what, what insights does he bring to the table, and and why, it, why is he out of step with the modern conservative movement? Well, because because he he sees capitalism as being in conflict with conservatism, mm-hmm. and there 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 is somebody else I. Uh, recommend i'm sure you've never heard of this man um but my i'm sometimes identified with him his name is panayotis kondilos he is greek he wrote in greek and german he's in germany taught at heidelberg for a while uh, he was acquaintance of mine um influenced both by schmidt and marx and um he was very much interested in understanding also conservatism and i think he must have been influenced by Mannheim. <clears throat> And he, he sees, you know, cap, industrial capitalism uh, as the enemy of conservatism. Uh, although what it leads to is what he calls the bürgerliche Denkwelt, the, the bourgeois world of thought, uh, as well as the bourgeois society. But he also distinguishes that from modern democracy, which he thinks is, is different. Uh, if you read my book after liberalism, I make all those distinctions. Mm-hmm. Okay, that uh, between bourgeois liberalism is different from conservatism, and modern mass democracy is entirely, you know, a a different creature from either bourgeois liberalism or conservatism. Uh, now, I want I want to move forward a little bit and and just um, kind of give you a list of names uh, one at a time to <laughs> just get your take on them because these are these are writers and we've already mentioned some of them. Uh, and I won't mention them again, that people just on the online right are interested in. And I'm just curious to have your take on them, whether you've read them or think they're um, not worth reading or whatever. So let's just start at the top here. Um, Heidegger. Yes. I mean, he's one of the great philosophers of the 20th century, great ontology, ontologist and Zeinun uh, uh, Zeit and Was is die Metaphysik and some of his other writings. I'm less impressed by his later writing. Uh, his early writing from the 1920s, 1930s, some of it is excellent. And uh, I've read Zion Insight at least five, six times. Okay. Um, and I continue to be impressed by by Heidegger. <clears throat> okay. What about Ernst Jünger? Yeah, I have, I've read a lot of Jünger without actually attending to this. I read some of his novels, just like uh, uh, often Mama or Klippen. And his, uh, I read with some interest his brief to his correspondence with... Um, with Carl Schmidt, and I come away admiring Jünger as a person much more than Schmidt. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he is a serious novel, a novelist. I'm trying to, th- to think of stuff by him that I have not read. Um, what, what, what is the the, the um, material that's published during and after World War II? It's Strahl something. I cannot remember Strahl. Well, I mean, his, his famous one is The Storm of Steel, but that's what an early one. That I've read, yes, Stahlgewitter, which is which is an early work, which has been interpreted in some ways as a critique of uh, of Nazism. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, not that it was after Mama Clinton. Yeah, that was earlier. The um, Stahlgewitter was written about World War One. It's written in the 1920s. Uh, you know, one of the themes that people on online um, like about <clears throat> him is his concept of the Forest Passage. Uh, and the anarch, the one who's not committed to right. any regime, because we kind of live in a post-Western world. Um, it's 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 very apocalyptic. Uh, but how yes, do you survive in that world? Uh, and I don't know if you've read or influenced by any of those themes. No, actually, I've not. I've okay. read some of his novels, and I read his correspondence with Schmidt. Uh, perhaps I should be reading more uh, uh, more Ernst Jünger. His bro- I've read his brother 
as well, mm. who was a novelist, uh, Carl Junger. Well, what's his, I'm trying to think of the, the, the Ernst, I cannot remember, his, I, I have the book on my shelf here. And uh, he was, uh, for a while, a more famous novelist. Yeah. Uh, so they're, 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 they're two brothers. Um, uh, y- y- Junger sort of emerges from World War II as sort of a, um, uh, sort of a, a, a figure that's sort of hard to place anywhere ideologically because he did serve in the, in the German military in World War II but was clearly an opponent of the Nazis, um, but also a person who was a figure of the revolutionary right. So mm-hmm. he's, he's, uh, he's sort of hard to type. Yeah, I mean, and that brings to mind all the other counter-revolutionaries that were um, opposed to what was happening in the interwar period, but who um, the Nazi regime didn't have time for. Like what's uh, Julius, uh, Edgar Julius, or you know who I'm talking about? Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to remember his last name. No, but he for a while was a member of the Nazi Party, wasn't he? Well, didn't he? Wasn't he killed during the Night of the Long he was, Knives? He was killed in 1934. Right, right. I mean, there's a whole bunch of those, you know, critics. I think of his last name. <laughs> right. Yeah, I have it on my shelf, but if I get up, I'll probably knock right. my camera over. I have over. it also on. I have a book on the Conservative <laughs> Revolution in my shelf, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah there, there were a number of those people got wiped out. And of course... Um, Gregor Strasser, whose brother Otto survives because he goes into exile, Die Schwarze Front, you know, they were sort of anti-Hitler Nazis uh, who then sort of fall out. They, Gregor gets wiped out in 34. Otto lands up uh, <clears throat> going somewhere and surviving. He was in Prague for a while and he went somewhere, somewhere else. Um, yeah, there were, there were a lot of these, there were a lot of these figures. Uh, and then, of course, the Nazis may well have done an Oswald Spengler. Mm. We're not quite sure the circumstances under which he died, but he did write critically about the Nazis. He's so he, he's he's actually the next on my list. Um, I, I mean, obviously you've read him. Uh, oh yeah. Have, have you benefited from reading Spengler? Absolutely. No, I mean, you know, even if you don't accept his his morphological theory of history uh, in its entirety, he is a profound thinker. You know, he has insights about the differences in civilization that are certainly worth studying. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and um, you know, I've uh, I, I was I was almost sort of a uh, a Spengler junkie. <laughs> I even <laughs> bought his his writings on prehistory. There's mm. 450 pages of his views about Paleolithic age, Neolithic age, and so forth. Um, you know, and <clears throat> he's he's not a particularly original or deep thinker on these subjects, but he is Spengler, so I <laughs> uh, who's who's a brilliant writer, you know, and a very, very deep uh, thinker uh, who was well-educated in a number of fields. So I, I did sort of plod through that book as well. Um, mm-hmm. I, I read, obviously, Poison Tum and Sozialismus, uh, Die Stunde der Entscheidung, and some of these earlier uh, works of his. Um, not all of which are even, uh, not, not all of them, in fact, none of them is really the quality of uh, uh, the Untergang, this Abendland, this, I mean, they're okay, but that work is is brilliant. You know, it has so many brilliant insights. As I said, even if you not accept his sort of cycle, you know, the, the the repeating cycles, you know, in all world civilizations. And by the way, that's very important in providing a kind of interpretive counterpoint to the Hegelian view, you know, uh, of progress um, mm-hmm. in history. I mean, he's he's rejecting that. He sees history as a kind of recurrence. He takes over the Nietzschean notion, you know, of uh, uh, the the ewige Wiederkehr, the Skalation, the eternal return of the same. The uh, and uh, he's giving you a very different view. <laughs> well, he's giving you that view that there's an eternal, but but not in a Nietzschean mythical sense, but as something which gives you an interpretive framework for understanding comparative civilizations. Mm-hmm. And there is a certain truth. I mean, you do you do see certain recurrent cycles. Um, uh, even if these civilizations really are di- uh, different. I, I think what he's doing, of course, is ignoring the importance of material progress. He says, you know, all, all of these things have technical sides and they all go from kultur to civilization. <clears throat> However, the West is unique, you know, in the degree to which it has become technical and in its uh, ability to produce material wealth. And medical advances and all kinds of things that do not exist in earlier civilizations. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it also is the most egalitarian, mm-hmm. right? I mean, there, there are many things that I think 
very clearly distinguish the West, what he sees as Faustian civilization. And I don't think he, you know, appreciates them as much as he should because of his framework. But I understand, you know, where he's coming from in terms of his, inter you know, in terms of his uh, uh, interpretive perspective, which, uh, which he applies very, very well. I mean, I he come, and he obviously has studied a lot of other civilizations uh, quite thoroughly. Uh, the, the work of Toynbee seems to be almost, and some of these other people seems to be almost a, a ripoff. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of Spengler, I actually do have a question. Someone wanted to know if you have ever read Imperium by Yaki. Um, some of it, I just couldn't get through it. Okay. Yeah. I thought. I, I mean, said it, 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 the, the, I, I know we had an article a few in Chronicles about Yaki. I, um, I'm not saying this because I'm afraid I'm going to be typed as a neo-Nazi or something like. I don't <laughs> hear. Uh, there, there are parts of Mein Kampf that I think are very well written and very interesting. Of, uh, um, although I do not think, I think Hitler was demonic, but um, uh, you know, I, I just don't find that much in Yaki. Um, it's, it's, uh, there is some vulgarized Nietzsche, vulgarized Spengler, um, but the final product does not in interest me very much. I have, one, I have one more controversial person that someone wanted me to ask about, and that's Julius Evola. Yeah, I don't know. I just don't find that much in Evola. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's sort, it's sort of Catholicism without Christ, and then he's influenced by Indian mysticism and uh, yoga and all kinds of, all kinds of other things. Um, yeah, I mean, he's sort of an interesting historical figure, uh, sort of like looking at the culture in which he lived and, you know, people on the far right who are not, you know, sort of not really fascist. I suppose mm -hmm. he sort of fits into that. I, ju I just cannot get that interested in his work. Right. Okay. Let's let's shift gears a little bit to someone less controversial. Um, what about? Uh, and I, I'm terrible at pronouncing him. Is uh, Dej uh, Jovenel? Yeah, Bertrand de Jovenel. <clears throat> his book Du Pouvoir, the book on power, is a great work. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's he has some deep insights about the nature of the modern state. Um. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm not particularly impressed by him, you know, as a political philosopher, but I think his analysis of the modern state is brilliant. <laughs> a few other, you know, and the way it seizes everything to seize power, it absorbs everything the modern administrative sees. He's absolutely correct, mm -hmm. you know, in his analysis. And I think I was over 60 when I, I read him for the first time. Oh, okay. But, uh, yeah, but, the, but his work impressed me very much. Okay. Uh, what about someone like George Santayana? Have you read him? Yeah, you know, he's, he writes well, although, it's, you know, he sort of writes in these periodic sentences, which was probably characteristic of the Edwardian age. And, I, you know, he's a person whom I like. I mean, I would have been very happy to meet him. Uh, he seems to be, you know, there is a kind of, he makes fun of the genteel tradition, but he represents that, gen, <laughs> that genteel tradition. Um, and I find his biography interesting. I just don't learn very much from him as a philosopher or as a political thinker. Okay. And I say, I say this with, you know, proper respect. I would have been happy to have him as a professor. Yeah. You, um, so in another book that was influential in the modern conservative movement was Richard Weaver's Ideas Have Consequences. Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, Weaver is somebody who... Uh, you know, makes Weaver sort of similar in some ways to Santayana. I just don't um, find his thought all that uh, arresting or original, but I would have been happy to have him as a professor. Uh -huh. He's like an eminently civilized person. <laughs> and I admire his defense of the South. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just don't see it, you know, as uh, uh, in terms of his defense of realism against nominalism and the great uh, plunge into modernity. I, I've never liked that theory. I think, I think it's ridiculous, in fact. Yeah, because I mean, you, you've, you've critiqued the idea of sort of a meta history, right? I mean. <clears throat> well, I, I mean, I, I criticize, although he's a Presbyterian and, you know, not a particularly observant Presbyterian um, weaver, that is a view you get among, uh, Catholic integralists very often that, you know, the Reformation was terrible and it led to, I don't know, uh, it led to AOC or, or even worse, um, 
you know, you go for, you go from from Luther to the Squad, you know, through. Um, I, I find most of these arguments absolutely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they sort of ignore about eight years of Western history. <laughs> and uh, as you know, I sort of share your view of the Reformation. I do not see it as, you know, opening the door to leftist chaos or anything like that. Uh, I see it as very conservative in some ways. And and the countries, you know, that, that, uh, that become Protestant, like Sweden, Prussia, uh, the Baltic states, uh, the uh, Switzerland, I mean, these are not radical countries, uh, right, which take over the, uh, the Protestant or these, uh, uh, these powerful centralized monarchies in Scandinavia, mm -hmm. you know, feudal monarchies, they become Lutheran. Mm -hmm. And even some of these early Calvinist countries are very conservative. Uh, so uh, I've, I've never really bought that argument. And, I, and of course, I, I think not nominalism is almost sort of a philosophical transitional step to Reformation theology. I think they, they are connected. I mean, Luther studied with nominalists, um, but I, I, re I really don't see, you know, the, the sky falling in once you reject medieval realism mm -hmm. um, or, you know, cease to be a Thomist or something like, like that. And I say that with respect for a lot of medieval philosophy. I mean, I have respect for Aquinas. I have respect for William of Ockham, for Duns Scotus and so forth. Uh, but I, but I, I, I think this, um, uh, this view, this, this, this view that somehow once you give up the high middle, uh, the Catholicism and scholasticism of the Middle Ages, you know, you, you fall into the abyss uh, of late modernity. I, I think this is, uh, this is nonsense. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say too, in, in defense of, of, of Protestants, um, they, there is a lot of academic <clears throat> work that's uh, sort of, um, making the case that nominalism actually did not have much of an influence on Protestant in the work of like Richard Mueller, uh, who right. studied continental, yeah. you know, reformation. And so I do have to say right. that in defense of myself, that I am not a nominalist. Um, but let me, let me go back to my list here. Another one was uh, a friend of yours, actually, John Lukas from Hungary. Lukács. Yeah. What, uh, what, 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 why do you like him? And because he, I, I think he had a little bit of a different take on, on someone like Churchill uh, than you do. Um, but just yeah, comment a little did. bit on his work. Yeah, <laughs> we were close personal friends. He reminded me of my father, who spoke with the same Hungarian accent and sort of looked like him. Um, and I like John very much. I, I think where we differ is that I was anti-communist. I think the communists were awful. I think the Soviets were terrible. <laughs> And he, it was always because of his experience um, having Jewish grandparents on his mother's side, although he was Catholic, um, he was very, um, he was very um, anti, anti German because of the Nazis and so forth. And Germans were always the, the fall guys when he would write. I, I did not share his, uh, you know, unadulterated admiration for Churchill either. Having said that, I liked a lot of his writing. I thought it was very interesting. Um, his book on historical consciousness is, is I, again, I don't agree with everything in that book, but I, th I think it has some brilliant insights. Uh, and um, uh, his, his admiration for George Kennan, I think was entirely justified. Um, he, he also wrote a great deal and he had a, um, uh, he had an arresting English style, although Hungarian was his, his first language, a language totally unrelated to English. Um, and he wrote on a great, on a wide variety of subjects, including Hungarian literature, which, uh, on which he wrote for the New Yorker magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, uh, I, I, you know, the, people were always questioning whether he was a real historian, I don't know, because he would write for a popular audience. Or because he didn't write for the academy, and my answer is yes. He was he was in fact a serious historian. Okay. Uh, in the last couple of minutes, I want to talk about some overrated thinkers. So, who do you think in the conservative movement is the most overreferenced or overrated thinker or writer in all in in his in history? Well, okay. Everybody in conservatism incorporated since the neoconservative takeover is vastly, vastly overrated. <laughs> People I see on Fox News are like, you know, there's almost carnival figures. Um, uh, National Review is almost unreadable now. So, I mean, you know, the entire conservative movement with very few exceptions is, is very overrated. Um, 
most of the liberals with whom they have dialogues are also very overrated. <laughs> they do not. Some people writing for the New York Times, you know, strike me as being almost functional illiterates at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I think I think we were talking about earlier periods of time. I hate to say this. Um, I, I know that most Southerners worship the man. I really don't think Jefferson is the intellectual equal of Alexander Hamilton. Mm. I, th I think it was an absolutely, bro uh, you know, Jefferson had thoughts about everything. He did a number of things. He was a brilliant architect. Uh, he, was, he was a serious scientist for the age in which he lived. His political thinking has never impressed me. Uh, it fortunately, he changed it, but I'm not particularly impressed by Jefferson. I am impressed by, by Adams and Hamilton um, and by some of the high federalists. I'm certainly impressed by John C. Calhoun, who I think was America's perhaps greatest political theorist. Um, <clears throat> um, I think we we're also discussing John Locke. And, uh, you know, I, I think there's some value in Locke. Uh, I, I think he is vastly overrated, particularly by the present conservative movement. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as I say, he's, he's sort of all right. You know, he's, uh, uh, he's sort of a representative political theorist for his age and, you know, writing on social contract theory in the late 17th century. Um, there are any number of other English political thinkers who impressed me far more, uh, including Thomas Hobbes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't, I think Robert Filmer, I find at least is <laughs> worth reading as, as John Locke. So, uh, I, I suppose I'm not on the same page with these people. Although there are things in Locke that I find, I mean, I, he's, he's, he's not somebody I find totally worthless. I mean, he does have ideas, political ideas that interest me. <clears throat> uh, there are other, who, who else? Reinhold Niebuhr. I have no idea if anybody reads him. I mean, he's, he's, <laughs> he's supposed to be, I suppose, a, a liberal Protestant thinker who was one of the founders of the ADA, the Americans for Democratic Action. Uh, Arthur Schlesinger, who was uh, widely read, only God knows why, when I was in college. Mm -hmm. John Kenneth Galbraith, does anybody even remember him? He was like a leading <laughs> liberal author. Um, most of these Catholic integralists I find extremely tiresome. Mm. A fellow named Vermeule, Adrian Vermeule, I can't even, he's, he's ridiculous, I can't even read him. So uh, those are, that's a short list. What about someone? What about someone with more lasting influence? Do you think Strauss is overrated? Um, yes and no. You know, I did a book on Leo Strauss for for, for Cambridge. Um, I think he's an extremely intelligent person who has the same ethnic background as a German Jew. Same back, uh, you know, and I sort of know where he's coming from. Um, uh, he's he's obviously highly intelligent, and he wrote some really good things. Um, I, he is, he is not my guru. There are many other people living in the same period of time who impress me much, much more like Carl Schmidt, like Carl Mannheim. There are lots of these people, mm -hmm. even in a store and like Eric Auerbach impresses me at least as much There's a lot of stuff by Hannah Arendt that impresses me. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I think he is overrated, but uh, to some extent, but, you know, I, I, I think he is a, a serious thinker nonetheless. And if you read my book, I do not, I know these Straussians say that I, I hate their founder and this, I, I'm critical of the Straussians. I am not, uh, pick East Coast Straussians, but I am not, uh, uh, I do not in any way demean Strauss. I, I think his existential experience as a German Jewish refugee profoundly influences his writing. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's hard to escape that impression. But, you know, I thought his book on Thomas Hobbes was excellent. Some of his work on Spinoza is very good. Some of his early German writing impresses me. Um, and, you know, even some of the insights that he has in works that he produced in the United States. So uh, he would definitely be in my canon, you know, of important people writing on classics, although I would not rate him as high as many other people, you know, uh, as, as other political theorists, or even some of the refugee mm -hmm. writers. Um, uh, who, uh, you know, Ernst Kassir, I find him very important thinker, particularly on Khan, symbolic. But so he's, um, you know, he's, he's, he sort of makes the grade. You know, mm -hmm. he, he's, he's in my, 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 my larger circle, but I, I do not venerate him the way the Strauss, he's, uh, nor 
do I uh, admire him for the, the same reasons that they do? Mm. Okay, one more person that I should have mentioned in the um, – I don't even know if he's underrated, but I should have mentioned him in someone that you like and you've, you've learned a lot from, and that's Max Weber. Um, what, what have you learned from Max Weber? A lot. <laughs> sociology. No, I mean, uh, Weber is a genuinely great social thinker. I mean, it's mm -hmm. uh, I know sometimes I don't mention names because it's, they're so obvious mm. that these people are influential. Um, I think his work on um, uh, capitalism, the spirit of capitalism and the Protestant ethic is co generally correct. Mm -hmm. I think there is, in fact, a correlation between Calvinism and capitalism. I think he's correct. Mm -hmm. He may exaggerate this. There, there may be exceptions, you know, like Hungarian peasants in Eastern Hungary were Calvinist or something. But, but there is very definitely a mindset in Calvinist Protestantism that is conducive to Cal and, and many of the leaders of the Industrial Revolution in England, right, in the 18th century were Calvinist. Mm -hmm. um, and in other countries, they were Calvinist. So I, I think there, there, there is that connection. Um, and a lot, a lot of the the other stuff that he wrote, for instance, on values, his work on values, I think, are is, is invaluable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, understanding value, the war of values, you know, the devout comp, uh, the uh, or devout come, the struggle over values. All these things are true. People struggle over values because they no longer um, have established traditions in which they live. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they grasp for values. And then they, these values like equality against liberty or something like that, but there, there, it's incredible. Some of his, uh, some of the in, the insights, his understanding of the modern state, you know, as being based on force, mm -hmm. uh, which of course is something that uh, Schmidt will later. But but some stuff that I I find in Schmidt is is already prefigured in the work of Weber. You mm -hmm. know, who comes a generation earlier. A generation what's earlier. what's his what's his relation to the German historical huh. school? Well, he's not part of the historical school. So there's you no know, relation at all? Yeah, I mean, you do have people writing, uh, members of the historical school, like Adolf Wagner and, and others, you know, who are writing in the, the late 19th century. Um, I can't say he has no connection because he may well, you know, have studied with some of these people. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, his um, uh, he, he's not really writing about... Uh, uh, about the, the kinds of historical developments that inter interest them. Okay. Uh, we're not about the historicals. We're, we're talking about the people who come like in the late 19th century, right? Not someone like Savigny, who was like coming in the early 19th century, but the people who were in the historical school in the late 19th century. Uh, most of those people were like um, uh, defenders of aut state autarky, uh, critics of capitalism. Um, they wrote works showing how the Prussian state was instrumental for industrial development. Um, uh, some of them were called Karte de Socialist and, you know, the, the socialist of the lectern, mm -hmm. uh, the sort of because of their, their, their uh, defense of a strong state. Mm -hmm. um, you get some, some of that in Weber, like when he's writing in a, almost a kind of German nationalist tone in his early work. But um, uh, I think he sort of moves beyond that. And he's very much, he's very much, he defines Many of the fields will become social theory or sociology uh, mm -hmm. uh, after his death. He dies right after the First World War um, in Munich. <clears throat> I think it's in 1918 or 1919. It's right after the war. Mm -hmm. um, so he really is a figure of the late 19th century. Okay, I promise. One last question. Yeah. Have you benefited from any of the Austrian economists, uh, Mises or Hayek or anyone like that? I mean, obviously yeah. Rothbard, but I'm talking about the specific yeah. The Economists. No, I, I, I really have. In the case of Rothbard, I learned a lot from his economic history. Mm -hmm. um, his book on the Depression, I think, is a goldmine of, of insight. Um, <clears throat> from from some, of the, some of the others, um, uh, but particularly Mises, uh, there is, a, a, I think, a profound understanding of bureaucracy and its effects, political bureaucracy. If you notice my work on anti-fascism, I have nice things to say about both, about both Mises and the and the uh, the Marxist, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, as analysts of fascism, because I think they both have insight. Um, so I I have benefited. I mean, I I cannot say that I'm an Austrian economist or this is the greatest influence on my life, <clears throat> but um, 
Uh, I have learned a lot from reading Mises on on economics, on socialism particularly. Mm-hmm. Good. Well, um, there's a lot of books and a lot of thinkers that we mentioned, and uh, we can't list them all. And Paul's not going to give me his list of 100 most influential thinkers, but I think it was a productive conversation and I enjoyed it. So thank you, Paul. And, and next time we'll have to carve out another niche and talk about other influences on your life. Well, thank you. Uh, this was this was a lot of fun and it, it, it forced me to remember books that I haven't looked at for at least 60 years. <laughs> right, right. Okay, well, thank you, Paul. And we'll talk to you next time.